Well, once upon a time, there was a particular commercial that raised a serious question. The setting was what seemed to be a romantic dinner. A young man and a young woman. You could tell that they were falling deeply in love, and there they were at the supper table, candles lit, and the setting staged. At the end of the meal... The man doesn't pull out an engagement ring. Rather, he throws down a credit card. And thus, the ethical question. Was it love or was it the miles? Was it love or was it the airline miles? It questioned the man's motives. Is he going to get anything out of this that would help him in his travels or was he really motivated by a deep sense of love was it love or was it the miles was it love or was it the rewards we're taught in our society today that what we call love can be motivated and manipulated by many things selfishness greed power our own self-esteem, our own sense of significance, and on rare, rare occasion, maybe romance. Rarely these days does it seem it's motivated by a genuine care and concern for the one in whom it is given. Many of us grow up starving for love. Many of us have never experienced genuine love in our lives. We don't even know what it is or if it even exists. Many times we're drawn away to an abnormal form of love or an unhealthy model of love, and that's what we're drawn to. The technical term for this is called dysfunctionality, a term used quite frequently these days. Yet the truth is many today are looking for love, searching for love, looking for love in all the wrong places. The most brutal truth is far harder to swallow. I'm afraid it's going to get far worse before it ever gets any better. One reason is that the family structure in America has changed. And with that, it changes everything. With the breakdown of the traditional family, love has become a foreign concept. In 1960, the traditional family represented 60% of all Households. Are you ready for this? Today it is said just 7%. That's staggering. Marriage has become an outdated institution. Many choose to live together instead. Growing trend is a single parent family. Divorce or having children. Outside of marriage seems to be the norm. As a result, the family unit behaves differently. They behave differently, they interact differently, and because of that, they think differently. Parents today seem to have fewer and fewer children. The children are often seen as a burden and not the blessing that they are. As a result, families are less likely to spend time together. The common complaint, everyone is just so busy. Meal times together are no longer commonplace any longer. Both parents work long hours. Sports hijack the schedule. Children today are spending a great deal of time in child care. Parents spend a great deal of money for child care. The result of the fragmentation of the family is the serious effect that it has on relationships. And so the question of, was it love, becomes a serious question of, what is love? A second reason for this is that we live in a society that moves further and further away from God. So where do we learn about love? We'd like to say we learn it from our families and our friends, but with the fragmentation of the family, Most of us learn about love 
from the society that we live in. A society that continues to shake its fist in the very face of God. A society that seeks to remove God. And a society and a culture that is seeking desperately to reconfigure God. Humanism, placing ourselves at the center of it all. Materialism, give me more so I can feel satisfied. Pragmatism, if it works it must be right. If it feeds me it must be good. Individualism, narcissism, hedonism, sensualism. That's just to name a few. You can add temporalism, cynicism, atheism, agnosticism, and all kinds of isms to fill up the bucket. What we need to know is this. In the midst of all of those isms, a godless society is a loveless society. And what we learn from a godless society about love guides our perceptions about that very love, especially in our relationship with God. Rather than God transforming our minds and our understanding of that, we allow everything else to transform our thinking, to influence our thinking. And then we transform our image of God as a result. J.B. Phillips In his classic book, Your God is Too Small, has a chapter entitled Parental Hangover. And he addresses the destructive ideas we have about God that hinder our very relationship with God himself. Many of these ideas were formed in fashion based on the very view of our parents or based on our experience being raised by our parents or grandparents generational thinking, patterns, habits, behaviors, treatments. Maybe your parents were never around. Maybe your parents were too demanding. Maybe your parents put a lot of pressure on you. Maybe your parents put pressure on you to perform, to succeed, and try to create in you the image of who they wanted to be and live their life through you. Any of their failures, they try to protect you from failing the same way. It's just part and parcel of the mix. Maybe they never showed you any love. Maybe they never showed you any care. Maybe they never showed you any compassion. Maybe they never offered you any grace. Maybe they never extended you any sense of forgiveness. Always holding it over your head, the mistakes that you've made through life. Maybe your very children are reminding you as a parent of those kind of mistakes. Maybe they never paid any attention to you. Maybe your parents abandoned you. Maybe in some form or fashion they neglected you. Maybe, maybe at some point they violated your trust. Maybe at some point they violated you. And what you learned was to never trust again. Never to put yourself in that kind of place to be harmed or to be in harm's way. So when we talk about this whole issue of love, you're like, you know what? I don't want to hear it. And you don't want to hear it because you've never known it. You've never experienced it. It's amazing how subtly these ideas transfer into our relationship with God. We start to say, well, why aren't you there when I need you? Why do you expect me to be so perfect? Or maybe you're a believer and you find yourself saying, why is it so hard to please you? Or why do you expect so much? Or why do you seem to demand so much? When I open up the scriptures, it's one law after another law, and you demand. And maybe you came out of a religious environment where that's all you knew. And so you learn to fear God in that sense of the word, but nothing about the love of God or the grace of God. Or why don't you hear me when I cry out? Why don't I ever see you? You're just like my mom. You're just like my dad. You're just like everybody else I've ever known in my life. Why is it you tell me you love me 
but deep inside, I'm not so sure that you do. How many of us have developed a dysfunctional view of God's love for us? And since this is true, then there's a few things that we need to know about God's love and then live in light of what we seem to know. If you would turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, I want us to look at verses 16 through 21, and I want to look at it this week and next week. Because I really thought to end the year, wouldn't we want to end the year resting? I've been talking a lot this year about resting in God. Wouldn't we want to end the year resting in His love? And then start the beginning of the year fresh resting in His love. Wouldn't we want to find ourselves as we turn the corner and we move from E free church to Stonebridge Bible Church, wouldn't we want to be found resting in the very center of his love? And I thought, what greater place could we ever be than to be found here? 1 John chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. Actually, I'd like to bring it up to verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. That's our relationship. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love, who we love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Scripture calls us to continually grow in our knowledge and in our understanding of God's love for us. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 through 19, we find Paul praying, and he calls us to pray as well, and he gives us some specifics. One of those is this, that we pray to know the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge. Called to know something that seems we can't fully know. But we're to pray to that end. Help us to know the love of Christ, the breadth of it, the height of it, the total expanse of it, which we're told is beyond our capacity to grasp. But we're called to keep growing. We're called to, in a sense, to be striving for it, to accumulate uh, better knowledge, uh, a greater grasp, a greater sense of conviction, of the love of God. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it tells us the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. That coming to saving faith in that process, and let's face it, we come and we realize that He wants to have a relationship with us. Isn't that what we promote? Isn't that what we preach? It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship. We can call Him Abba, Father, a term of endearment, a term of adoration, and a term of affection. That that love of God has been poured out within our hearts. In the imagery there is literally, it floods the heart. It overflows. And we've got the Wisconsin River, and you've got bridges, and you've got dams, and you have some control mechanisms for the river. But back in the day, oh man, when that river flooded, it flooded. And when rivers overflow, they take over everything. Everything is saturated. That's the imagery here. The love of God has flooded our hearts. 
And yet many a Christian lives as though they're dry and they're empty in the love tank of their very souls. And so we come to 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, and it says, We have come to know and have believed the love that God has for us. Egnokamen comes from gnosko, is used of a full knowledge, a full, comprehensive understanding and knowledge as it relates to the topic of concern. Couple that with pistuo, it can be translated to rely upon. We know fully, we comprehend fully, and we rely upon, or we place a deep, confident trust within, a firm and convincing belief And John uses these two terms and he couples them together as if they were a compound verb. We know and rely. It's as if he brought the two together to say this should be deeply, deeply embedded within our souls. Both are in the perfect tense, indicating an abiding reality. It began in the past, and it continues in the present, and it will continue until we are in his presence. We see him face to face and through the whole of eternity. And so when it comes to our faith, we of all people should know deeply and trust completely in this thing we call the love of God. And yet the difficulty for many of us is sometimes it's hard to know what we believe. And many times it's even harder to believe what we already know. We know it here, but wow, do we struggle with it within. So I want to focus on one aspect of this passage this week and next week as well. One small statement that sets the stage for everything else that this passage speaks about. One huge statement that teaches us much about the love of God. It simply states, God is love. Short phrase provides plenty as it relates to God and as it relates to his love. God is love. And what we have to know is this. God's love, because he is love, will never, ever contradict his character. The starting point for us is God and who he is. Everything else flows from that. We reverse the equation. We get our definition of love from everybody and anybody else. And then we transfer that into every and every other relationship, including God himself. The starting point in understanding God's love is to understand love in light of God's being. In 1 John 1, 5, it states God is light. It's a statement reflecting God's purity and God's holiness. And that the light is not something that God can turn off and turn on, but light is what God is in his being. He shines. His Shekinah glory. Oh, veiled in the humanity of Christ, but peeled back, oh my land, brighter than the brightest sun, Scripture would tell us. Blinding, because God is light. In John chapter 4, verse 24, it states God is spirit. Not God is a spirit, but God is spirit. Therefore, he's not limited to time, space, or place. But God is perfectly one with himself and within himself. That God has no parts. His personality, his powers, his attributes are perfectly integrated in who he is. 
And so in John chapter 4, verse 16, where it states God is love, it's not a definition. It's a statement of fact. In fact, he uses it also in verse 8. He repeats it to emphasize this very truth. In pure context, Scripture, u- scripture uses the noun and not the verb to describe God because it's who he is. We think of God as loving. Okay, that's the verb. God noun is love noun. He only does what he does out of who he is. Very important distinction. Love is not something assigned to him, but love is something that is ascribed of him. It's essential, and it's a central attribute which all the other attributes are harmonized. Therefore, love as an attribute of God is a revelation of his inner being. He can only love. We think of love-hate relationships because we see them all the time. The enemy is filled with hate. God is love. It's all he can do is love. What's the most loving thing you could ever, ever do for someone? we got to reach deep for that. And we really do have to reach deep sometimes. And to be sacrificial. It's just the essence of God to do it. He doesn't know how to do it any other way. He couldn't even think of another way to do it. Because he's love. Therefore, love as an attribute of God is a revelation of his inner being. And the qualities of God which constitute who he is. He's holy. He's faithful. He's just. He's love. And those permanent qualities can't be gained, can't be lost, can't be changed, can't be altered, and cannot be improved. It's perfect love time and time and time again. He can't do anything otherwise. They're inseparable from his being and inseparable from the essence of who he is. We hear the song and the lyrics in our mind. Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? It's just a secondhand emotion. It's what's drilled into our minds. We start to believe it's true. As an extension of who God is. What's love got to do with it? It's just a second-hand emotion. Oh, it's more than that. God cannot be compartmentalized. Be holy one minute and then not. Or be merciful one minute and then not. Rather, God is always holy. He's always merciful. He's always faithful. He's always eternal at all times. So God's love can never, ever contradict his character. If that were to ever happen, he ceases to be God. We might as well close the book because we're all in real, real trouble. There's some things God cannot do. And one of them is to cease from being God, who he is. His love is perfect in light of who he is. It's a holy love. It's a kind love. It's a merciful love. It's a just love to be sure. But he only knows how to be who he is. Perfectly loving. You ever experienced that kind of love in your life? From anyone other than God himself, have you ever experienced that? Maybe glimmers of it. Where you felt just loved on. To the point you didn't even know how to receive it. Let alone accept it. A mother, a dad. I mean, most of us men are starving for that kind of love from our dads. I mean, there's books written on that topic. We don't know how to do it. Why don't we know how to do it? Because we've never seen it. 
in our lives. And then God, our Father, is going to love us. And we're like, what? We read it. We don't necessarily understand it because we've never experienced it. But if you have a brief moment in time where it captured your heart, and you're like, I'm accepted for who I am. I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm restored. I'm, I'm, I'm the prodigal son, and my dad's there to give me the hug. I mean, all that stuff, a glimmer of a moment in time. You have it, and you go, oh. Capture that moment. Put it in a bottle. Fill that bottle up. You ever have one of those big water bottle jugs and you try to save coins and pennies and fill that puppy up? Well, you usually spend it before you fill the tank. That's the way love is, I think. Take all of that moment and fill up a jug like that. We haven't even scratched the surface of the love of God. God is love. And we know it. But I'm not always convinced that we believe what we know. John is writing to us saying, you know, and you believe. And you need to keep on believing. You need to keep on growing in your knowledge. But you got to trust in it. you got to be convinced of it. Because if you're not, every other messenger is going to distort your understanding of this. And everything else that John talks about flowing out from it is going to be distorted and dysfunctional as well. The starting point, point always is to bring us back to God and who He is. And to rest in it. Just to rest in it. The result of this, at least looking at some of the negatives, next week we'll look at the positives, is this. If we truly know it and trust in it, it should help guard against such thinking as, where's God's love when I need it? How many of us in the body of Christ have ever said that? How many of us in the body of Christ have ever thought it? And yet if God is omnipresent, and if God is love, then his love is always present. If God is imminent, which means he is near, we spoke early on about his transcendence. He is wholly other. He is high and lifted up, which for many only reinforces that he's out there, but I'm down here. And yet the wonder and the miracle of the incarnation is that we see God in human form. He who has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. You have any questions about that? Look to me, Jesus would say. Look to me and you'll see the heart of the Father. And so he's imminent. He's near. It is God with us. And if God is imminent, if he is close and near to us, and if God is love, then his love is always near to us. His love is always next to us. And because of regeneration, quite frankly, his love is within us if we would simply let it be. Thomas T. Well has written some years ago, Keith Brown, the senior pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and the pastor who mentored me after I graduated from Princeton Seminary, this is for Thomas, saw a man after church at the coffee hour with a symbol on his lapel. It was a symbol of a bulldog. Not knowing that the bulldog was a symbol for Mack Trucks, and not knowing that Frank worked for Mack Truck, he naively said, Frank, what does that bulldog symbolize? Frank got a twinkle in his eye and said, well, Keith, the bulldog symbolizes the tenacity with which I hold on to Jesus Christ. Keith said, well, Frank, it's a wonderful symbol, but you have lousy theology. Frank said, what do you mean? 
He said, she never stand for the tenacity with which you hold on to Jesus Christ. She should stand for the tenacity with which Jesus Christ holds on to you. Secondly, she should guard against thinking God only loves me when I'm good. God only loves me when I'm pleasing to him which for the vast majority of us puts us in an awkward place because a good 75% of the time, things ain't so good. Which means half of my day, I'm wondering if he loves me. If you're really walking rightly, at least 25% of the day, you got to be thinking that. If not, then you got some issues with humility. But it guards against that God only loves me when I'm good, when I'm earning, when I'm churning. When I'm pleasing him. And many of us have been taught that kind of conditional love. And we earn it. If, if God is immutable, if God is unchangeable, and if God is love, then his love is never changing. It doesn't go up and down based on the barometer of my life. <clears throat> when I've hit a home run. Or when I've struck out, when I've loaded up the bases, or when I can't even walk up to the plate. If God is eternal and God is love, then He's always loved us and He always will. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 God demonstrated His love for us that even when we were yet sinners, Okay, let's just take off all the glossy veneer of our Christianity and peel away to the good old days. Even when we were sinners, that bad, nothing holy about us, he demonstrated his love for us. Does God love the sinner? Yeah, we say it all the time. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. But after a while, we forget that as it relates to us. Then does God still love me even when I fail him in the here and now? Does God love sinners? Does he reach out and redeem sinners? Does he reach out and forgive sinners? We say, yes, with convincing, convincing belief. And then we look in the mirror of our own souls and we wonder to ourselves, how can he even love me? Because I failed here. I dropped the ball here. I don't measure up as a good Christian over here. He loved me when I was that disgusting. Now somehow that's all changed? Or somehow when I grind it out, I preached the best 30-minute message of my life. Just preaching a 30-minute message. Trying to see if you're all awake here. That somehow he's going to love me more. Somehow I touched his heart. Scripture seems to indicate He loves me in the midst of the good, the bad, and even the ugly. Is God happy when we rebel? Of course not. He's holy and he's just. But even God's discipline, even God's discipline and his correction is motivated by his love. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 9. If you could turn there, it's just a little bit back from 1 John. So if you go to your left a little bit, you're going to find Hebrews chapter 12. The writer writes, You've not resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. You And you've forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons, as children, as family. 
You've forgotten the exhortation. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It's for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the father doesn't discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which you all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us. We respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. He disciplines us for our good. He's always looking out for us. He's always looking out for what's going to be best for us. And the imagery there is that earthly fathers, either, even when we get it right, many times we're doing it because it's in our own self-interest. We did it because it was good for us. God does it because it's good for us. It's a big, big, big difference. Henry Newman said, God wants to me, God wants me to be with him, not to do things to prove I'm valuable. God wants to be with me. God wants to spend time with me. God wants to love you. He doesn't want you to run around having to prove that you're valuable. He knew how valuable you are. He knows how valuable we all are. That's why he went to the cross. He doesn't need us to run around proving to him that we're worthy of it. Otherwise, we fall right back into a works form of righteousness where he rewards us with his love when we start to think we can walk with perfection. One saint has said, you don't have to pester God to get his attention. You don't have to grovel. You don't have to flail yourself. You don't have to bite your lip and groan and moan and all these kind of things that people do to show God that they really mean business. If one of my kids ever called me and said, Daddy, please, 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 I beg of you, I petition you. I'm pleading with you. Listen to my need. I say, time out. I don't like the underlying assumption here. You don't have to go through all those gymnastics. Nothing in my life is more important than you. And what gives me greater pleasure in life than meeting, what gives me greater pleasure in life than meeting the needs of my children? What gives me greater satisfaction in life, greater pleasure in life than watching my children flourish, watching my children succeed? How many of us as parents withhold when we see that? And Christ would say, if you then, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven know how to give the great stuff, the best stuff to his children? He doesn't qualify that by the good ones versus the bad ones. He gives good gifts to us all. Why? He can't do anything less. And oh, by the way, he couldn't love us anymore. He couldn't. God's love can never, ever contradict his character. And because of that, God can never love me 
any better than he already has. And he can never love me any less than he will always love me. Because he's love. And I think as the people of God, we have got to learn to rest in that. But there's more. And that's where we want to pick the passage up next week. There's so much more. And it's cultivating a greater understanding of God's love and light of who God will always be. Next week, we're going to look at the positive aspect. If God is love, and all these attributes start to pile up, what does that really mean? For me? For you? And then if that's true, how does that then extend it out to every other relationship that I encounter? Because John does speak to that. He talks about fear. Talks about hate. Talks about how love can't coexist with either one. Especially with our God. And as I look out in the landscape of the church, certainly in light of our nation, the world, there's a lot of fear. But I meet with Christians on a regular basis, both here and otherwise, in the office or on the phone. A lot of counseling. And what I hear over and over again is fear. Uncertainty. And then I look at the trouble within the body of Christ and the animosity. Relational ruptures. How does love and this coexist? And Scripture would say they don't. What about love? What about fear? They don't. In God's economy, theologically, the two can never rub shoulders. We need to get that because if we're operating in fear and if we've gotten some hatred and animosity coming in, we've got to look at this. We've got to go back to the starting point, theologically speaking, and to be centered and to be anchored in the sense that he's love and rest in that because out of that it affects every relationship we will ever encounter in the rest of our lives. The big time stuff. And I just thought as we launch into the new year, what better way to launch than to refocus and recenter our lives and this ministry and rest in that pocket. He's love. Strip everything else away. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to ever know. And it drives and determines everything else I do, I pray. And we will become, out of this, I pray, one of the most loving communities this community will ever know. Because they'll walk in these doors and they'll see it. They'll know it. And they'll experience it. Maybe for the first time in their lives. That's the kind of ministry we want to be. Because that's the kind of God that we believe in. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We, we cry out, thank you. We're overwhelmed by your mercy and your grace. overwhelmed by your love. Eloquence doesn't do it justice. Mere words. Seems so frail for such a lofty, lofty concept. But Father, I pray that we just learn, just learn to rest in your love for us. 
not to rearrange our thinking. To bring you down to that common place of a fallen humanity. That you would love us like the world loves us. Like any human relationship models for us. It dulls our spiritual senses. And so, Father, we pray for an awakening, a revival within our hearts and our beings, igniting a flame within us, fueled by that very love. May we never take advantage of it, Father. May we never, never trample upon your love and your grace. But, Father, I pray, help us to learn to rest in it. Because if we don't learn how to do that, we're always, always grinding it out, looking for some sense of reward. And so, Father, help us, I pray. Guide us, we pray. Grow us, we ask. And may you receive the glory, we pray in Christ's name.